Hey, uh, welcome to the beginning of our discussion of chapter 10, emotion. So experiencing and displaying emotion is a really, really critical part for, of existence for many, many types of uh, organisms. Um, though your personal experience of what evokes emotions and how you respond to those can, can vary quite a bit. We're focusing in, at least initially, primarily on some more negative emotions like fear and anger, just because in the concept of biological psychology, they are so much um, better studied. That and um, other emotions, positively motivated emotions, are discussed elsewhere throughout this uh, unit. So we're going to start off by talking about the amygdala and its role in fear. But before we get into specifics, let's talk about sort of defining uh, emotions in terms of an emotional response. So. There's a few different components we can talk about. There's the behavior response, behavioral response, which is, to break it down to its most basic bits, uh, muscular movements that are appropriate to the situation. What is your physical response in terms of experiencing an emotion? Next up, we have our autonomic responses. We're not going to spend too much time dwelling on our autonomic uh, responses because because we've talked about them elsewhere in, uh, in this class. So if you remember things like uh, the HPA axis and the mobilization of the autonomic nervous system to affect uh, mobilization of energy, right? So when our autonomic nervous system becomes activated, sort of uh, through a fight or flight type response, we see things like increased heart rate, shunting of blood towards the muscles, basically just a mobilization of energy to deal with some sort of a threat. So in addition to that, sort of downstream of the initial autonomic responses are hormonal responses. So things like the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine from our adrenal cortex uh, at the end of the HPA axis. Uh, increasing blood flow to the muscles, just sort of being a counterpart of the uh, autonomic um, changes that take place. So we have our behavioral responses, our autonomic responses, and the trailing hormonal responses. So as you may imagine, um, behavioral, autonomic, and hormonal components are controlled by separate systems, though there's some integration of those components and control exerted over those components by the amygdala, right? Which if you know one thing about amygdala, you know fear. I have almonds pictured here because uh, um, amygdala means almond. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, some very, very simplified uh, amygdala neuroanatomy. So um, the amygdala is divided up into uh, a number of different subregions, more than we're going to be able to talk about here. So for now, let's just talk about it in terms of being having three separate regions that you'll need to know. The first is the lateral nucleus, often abbreviated as LA. This receives somatosensory, I'm sorry, this receives sensory information from the neocortex, thalamus, and hippocampus. So it's receiving a lot of information about what's happening in your environment. So we have sensory information and the like coming in from the thalamus and the cerebral cortex. Uh, we have information about things we know already from our hippocampus, and that's all sort of being integrated in the lateral nucleus. Uh, the basal nucleus receives information from the lateral nucleus, right? So it's receiving inputs uh, from the lateral nucleus. Um, there's more going on here. Um, the basal nucleus has its own processing that takes place, and it's, uh, it's a unique contribution to the circuit, but we're not really going to get too much into that. Just know that it's sort of an ancillary component of the lateral, lateral nucleus, to think of it very, very simply. Uh, the central nucleus is conceptualized primarily as a, an output structure. Of course, uh, like with most things we talk about, it's a bit more complicated than that but it does have a role as an output structure, right? It projects to lots of fear-affecting regions like the hypothalamus, midbrain, pons, and medulla. So these projections that go throughout the brain can be, uh, are really involved in the production of our emotional responses. So to summarize in sort of a, a painfully simple way, losing out on uh, some of the nuance, um, the lateral nucleus and uh, sort of by proxy, the basal nucleus are sort of a place where information gets integrated. So we have information coming from a lot of different places being sent into the um, lateral and basal nucleus. In fact, uh, changes take place here when we learn associations about fear predicting stimuli. So if we learn something is scary or painful or harmful to us, uh, changes will take place to support the memory here. Um, then from this uh, sort of complex, the lateral and the basal nucleus, we have outputs that go to the central nucleus of the amygdala. And from here, a little processing takes place, and then uh, projections sent out to these fear effectors will produce our emotional response, whatever that may be. So let's talk a bit more about the amygdala in the context of the production of our fear response. So we know from some stimulation studies that your, your book talks about in some more detail that we can have stimulation of the hypothalamus that can lead to autonomic responses that are experienced or expected to happen during fear. 
So things like the racing heart rate, um, you know, shunting of blood to the muscles, all that kind of stuff. So we could have the sort of autonomic effects of fear produced by hypothalamus stimulation, but no subjective feeling of fear, right? The subject might um, sort of feel those autonomic effects, but they don't have an emotional component, right? They don't report feeling scared. However, stimulation of the amygdala produces not only these autonomic responses, but also the subjective sort of feeling of dread or fear. So lesion studies, so um, subjects without an intact amygdala will fail to acquire uh, conditioned emotional responses. So sort of like I mentioned previously, and we'll talk about this um, in just a moment, uh, the ability to acquire a predictive relationship between something predicting a negative outcome in terms of like a, a painful or fear-producing stimulus. Um, so those who do not have an intact amygdala are not able to acquire that sort of predictive emotional conditioning. We talked about this previously with um, the woman who had orbach white disease who uh, couldn't develop fear responses. So it's sort of a similar idea. So sort of also going off of that, amygdala lesions can interfere with emotional memory. Uh, in uh, an experiment that your book details, um, subjects were told a story about a boy who was injured in a traffic accident. It's accompanied by these sort of graphic illustrations of some really like uh, graphic depictions, I guess, of this accident. Um, healthy subjects show an enhanced memory for the traumatic portion of the story, right? That traumatic um, graphic imagery uh, is sort of sticks out to ordinary people, right? You have a good memory for things that uh, shock you in that way. However, those subjects with amygdala lesions don't show an enhancement of that memory, right? The, uh, the graphic sort of emotion-provoking stimuli and those graphic images don't stick out to somebody with amygdala damage any more than any other detail in the story. So they don't show any enhancement for that. All right, let's talk a little bit about the amygdala's role in associative learning. I'm sure most of you are familiar with classical conditioning. Um, if you're not, it might be a time to look back at your gen psych notes and refresh yourself about what that is. Um, we're also going to talk in much more detail about um, associative learning in a subsequent chapter. But for now, let's just talk about associative learning in terms of the amygdala. So this is a highly simplified circuit of, um, I guess, detecting a uh, noxious stimulus and the output that is produced by you encountering a painful stimulus. So I've schematized here just various inputs to the amygdala. As we talked about earlier, there's a lot of things that project into the amygdala. But things like thalamus, hippocampus, etc. We've talked about this already previously in this unit, so look back if you're forgetting what projects into the lateral nucleus. I have represented here specifically two elements of an example we're going to be talking about. Sound information, so auditory information, and pain information. So let's use the example that your book uses uh, because I kind of like it. It's, it's kind of dumb, but it's, uh, it's fun. So let's say you're using a little hand mixer trying to make a cake or something like that. And the hand mixer makes a funny noise and then shocks you. Uh, having a natural response to that, you, you become frightened from the loud noise and the shock that follows. You drop the mixer, um, your heart starts racing, your palms sweat a little bit, and you're like, oh, what happened? That was really scary. Uh, am I okay? Good, I'm okay. So let's talk through exactly what happens in your system when that series of events takes place. So first you hear that sound, right? The, the mixer starts rattling and making a weird noise. So that means you're going to get auditory information um, projecting to the lateral nucleus of your amygdala. That doesn't produce much of a response, right? That thing making a sound isn't innately all that terrifying to you. Uh, but what happens next is the shock. So you receive some nociceptive information, a painful shock delivered to your hand. So you receive some input about that pain information into the lateral nucleus of your amygdala as well. When that arrives, your lateral nucleus is going to become active. It's going to send some information to your central nucleus and say, hey, something scary just happened. We should react to that. Your central nucleus is then going to send information to your fear effectors, things like your hypothalamus. That's going to cause the production of autonomic responses, right? Uh, you might let out a shout or show a fearful expression on your face. Your heart rate's going to increase. You're going to have a fear response to the scary thing that's just happened to you. So let's say you're a brave soul and you go back and you decide that you want to, you, you, you repair your mixer and you decide, hey, I don't think it's going to hurt me again. I'm going to use this to make a cake. Again, it's not going to shock me. So let's just get to it. So let's say you do that. You're, you're going to town with your hand mixer and then it makes that same sound again. It starts rattling just like it did before it shocked you. What's your response going to be? 
probably you're going to have a fear response, right? You're going to drop that mixer and say, oh crap, I don't want to get shocked again. So that sound is going to activate the same inputs as before, right? The sound inputs from your auditory system are going to activate the lateral nucleus of your amygdala. However, something different is going to happen this time. Even though you're not shocked, um, the connection here has been strengthened. So that sound that didn't scare you before, now it scares you. So because of the process that has strengthened this connection, the lateral nucleus is going to be activated strongly enough just by the sound information to activate the central nucleus, which is then going to activate your fear effectors and produce a fright response, right? You're going to say, oh, I'm not messing with this. I know what happened last time. I'm going to put this thing down. Your heart's going to start racing. You have a little bit of a fear episode. Um, so that's happened in spite of the fact that you weren't shocked because you've learned something, right? You've learned that that rattling sound predicts a fearful stimulus, and that's going to cause real changes in your lateral nucleus. So while previously this connection, sound information coming in, wasn't enough to drive a response, now it is. So now you've learned that something is scary. All right, so let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, anger, aggression, and impulse control. So most species of animals have the ability to show aggressive behaviors, right? Things like threatening gestures or actual attacks. These tend to be species typical, right? They're sort of an innate thing that a species can do, right? Owls are going to get poofy, make themselves look really big and threatening. When they attack, they'll attack in the same way, right? Species, members of the same species often attack in a similar way. Wolves will arch their backs and sort of bare their teeth, make themselves look bigger and scarier. Um, so there are sort of ingrained species-typical ways of showing uh, aggression and uh, showing anger. These behaviors are controlled largely by genetically programmed neural circuits, so there's a basis for these behaviors in the brain. When it comes to human aggression, in fact, many types of animal aggression, there are a number of factors that are important, right? There's first off an environmental component. So early experience can foster the development of aggressive behavior. So you can imagine if you're in a, growing up in an environment with lots of um, violent models for you to follow, if you have lots of friends or family members who like to solve problems with violence or show aggression um, in response to frustrating situations, you might learn to do that as well. Uh, though that's not the whole story, it never really is. There's also a genetic component. Some people are just predisposed to be more aggressive than others. So looking at twin studies uh, that measured antisocial behavior and unemotional behavior found a higher concordance between monozygotic and dizygotic twins, which suggests that there is a genetic sort of heritable component that might predispose some towards aggression. We'll talk a bit more about the specifics of how that might happen neurobiologically uh, next time. So that's it for our uh, first mini lecture on emotion. Next time, we're going to talk about the role of serotonin in aggression.